in John 5, Jesus points out that the Jewish leaders, uh, to the Jewish leaders, that while they were diligently searching the Old Testament scriptures to find the way of eternal life, they had failed to recognize how these scriptures pointed to Jesus himself. We recognize that the Old Testament contained many types of Christ, individuals who in some small way illustrate something of or point to the Lord Jesus. Melchizedek is shown in Hebrews 5 to 7 to point to the priesthood of Christ. Moses in Deuteronomy 18 says God will raise up a prophet like him from amongst the people. When the Jews recognise that this was something more than the prophets of the Old Testament. For example, John the Baptist asked whether Jesus was the prophet who was to come. David is the triumphant king who was the model of the coming Messiah king. And the life of Joseph is littered with parallels to the life of Christ. In a similar way, the Old Testament nation of Israel is an illustration of the New Testament church. One is a cohesive, physical nation being led to a physical land, while the church is a dispersed, spiritual nation being led to a spiritual world, albeit with a physical dimension to it, as they will inherit a recreated world where they will dwell in the presence of God. So while we look at individuals who have some prominent role in the life of God's people and they point us to Christ, we can also look at the nation of Israel and see something of the church of Christ. Israel is a nation of God's chosen people who receive promises and blessings illustrating the promises and blessings the church receives. So, for Israel, there is a promised land of rest for those who obey God's commands. For the Christian, there is a promised land of eternal rest for those who put their trust in the Lord Jesus, in his death for our sins, and in his resurrection that promises a new life in the presence of God. But we are talking about mortals, sinners. So the types of Christ in the Old Testament are flawed. While there is some imagery pointing to Christ, it is always marred to a varying degree through because of the sinful nature of mankind. In the same way, the pictures of the church in the Old Testament reflect the weaknesses and failures of Christians in the New Testament in the church today. But of course, that is to be expected. At their very best, the Old Testament Israelites were sinners undergoing a process of sanctification in the same way that the Christian does. It is not until we become glorified saints in that eternal kingdom that we will have perfection. Consequently, it is perhaps easier to see the weaknesses of the New Testament Christians in the lives of the Old Testament Israelites. We can therefore learn about ourselves by looking at Old Testament Israel. And that's what we'll attempt to do tonight as we explore Psalm 106. But first, take a quick look uh, at Psalm 105 which is logically paired with Psalm 106. Psalm 105 pictures the redemption of Israel out of Egypt. Israel is saved out of slavery in Egypt. The Christian is redeemed from slavery in a world of sin, that is fallen in sin. And like the Israelite, the Christian is redeemed according to God's everlasting covenant. But in Psalm 105, the psalmist is concerned particularly 
with the wonders that God performed to rescue his people from Egypt. Although not in a chronological order, the psalmist points to the plagues that broke the power of Egypt to contain Israel. But then finally, the psalmist points to the power of God displayed to bring Israel through the desert, uh, the deserts of this world, to the promised land. They finally receive that promised inheritance that God had given to Abraham. We're going to look at Psalm 106 in uh, five sections. So we will look at verses 1 to 3, praise of God the Almighty. Verses 4 and 5, a plea for God's mercy. Verses 6 to 46, a review of the history of God's people and their sinfulness. Verse 47, a plea for God to restore his people. And verse 48, praise of God, uh, plus probably a conclusion to the fourth book of Psalms, which ends at the end of Psalm 106. So first, verses 1 to 3, praise of God Almighty. The, psalm, the unknown psalmist starts by acknowledging the wonder of God. God is good. He deserves our thanks, not simply for his goodness, but because he is God. But God's goodness is displayed everlastingly. His love endures forever. It is this everlasting love that the psalmist emphasises here because of what he's going to highlight later in the psalm. God's love is undeserved. God is unlike us. His love is so great, so undeserved, that in verse 2, the psalmist expresses his wonderment at God by asking a question. Who can proclaim the mighty acts of the Lord or fully declare his praise? Effectively, the psalmist is saying that God's love is so great that we cannot fully express it. We read the stories like Psalm 105 that records some of the mighty deeds of God. But who can really grasp these mighty acts? It's easy to recite the ten plagues of Egypt that brought release for God's people. But we weren't there. We don't understand the depths of the suffering of the Israelite slaves in Egypt. None of us have ever been in such a situation. And even if we had, time dulls the memory, even a memory scarred by deep wounds. So we cannot know what the plagues meant to the Israelites, the hope they created, the fears of the Egyptians as, a, as they reject each miracle and perhaps took vengeance upon the people of Israel. No, like any aspect of the wonder of God, we cannot fully express these wonders. And consequently, we cannot declare, declare the praise due to God for his love and his mercy towards his people. Verse 3, therefore, presents something of enigma. We might think that those who act justly, those who always do what is right, effectively those who seek to honour and please God and walk in his ways, such people might deserve God's mercy and grace. But that's not the type of people that this psalm concentrates on. We do not walk according to God's will. We do not always do what is right. And consequently, we do not deserve God's blessing. It reminds us that of that amazing verse in Romans chapter 5, verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So God's love demonstrated on behalf of his people is not something that we have deserved. We receive God's mercy because God chooses to lavish his love on his chosen people. We cannot understand the depths of our sin. So how can we understand the greatness 
of God's love towards us. In in just the same way, the psalmist may have known of the rescue of Israel from Egypt, but could not fully express what had happened centuries before. So how can we fully express praise due to God for his mercy towards his chosen, undeserving people? Second, a plea for God's mercy. Who deserves God's mercy and blessing? No one. We are all sinners and consequently we would deserve God's wrath and judgment. But as we've just seen, the psalmist recognises that God is good, that he pours out his love and blessing on an undeserving people. And so the psalmist now pleads for God's mercy. Remember me, Lord, when you show favour to your people, come to my aid when you save them, that I may enjoy the prosperity of your chosen ones, that I may share in the joy of your nation and join your inheritance in giving praise. The psalmist is not just saying that he acted justly, that he always did what was right. He simply asks for God's mercy. He asks to be included in the people of God who receive that immeasurable love that endures forever, which he has already sung about. He knows that God will show favour to his people. He knows that God will save his people and pleads that he might enjoy these benefits, that he might enjoy the prosperity of God's chosen people, that he might share the joy of God's people so that he might worship God with God's people. The Old Testament is full of references to the chosen nation, a people who were to live together to honour God. And similarly, the New Church, uh, the New Testament church was not an unconnected group of people who acted independently. Christians come together as a church. Paul went around establishing churches. They were, to be a commu- they were to be communities of God's people who worked and worshipped together in an ordered way, guided by the word of God. At times they shared things in common with each other according to their needs. They made collections to support those who were suffering. And the writer of the Hebrews urges the Christians to remember others. Keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing so, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. Continue to remember those in prison as if you you were together with them in prison and those who are ill-treated as if you were yourselves were suffering. The psalmist is not just seeking God's blessing. He is seeking community, a fellowship that shares the love of God as well as his blessing. He wants to share in the joy of a nation. He wants to join God's inheritance, God's chosen people. Third, a review of the history of God's people and their sinfulness. The psalmist wants to share in the blessings that God pours out on his chosen people. But he wants to share in those blessings in community, to worship and to honour God in community, not as an isolated individual. And so verse 6 sets the context for what follows. Yes, the psalmist is part of that community of God's people. And so he shares the blame and the guilt of that community too. He's not saying all our troubles are a result of our ancestors. No, we have sinned. We have done wrong. If he is to share in the blessings, he must also share in the in their responsibilities and their consequences. It is no good blaming others. There is a saying that comes from the Jewish 
uh, Nazi hunter Simon Wiesenthal and others, for evil to flourish, it only requires good men to do nothing. We cannot simply stand aside as our own nation plunges further and further into sin and pretend it has nothing to do with us. If our government passes laws that are contrary to God's will, we too must bear responsibility. What did we do to prevent such things? Wiesenthal was talking about the evils of Nazi Germany. And there were those who did stand up for, against such things, often paying the price of their own lives. And that is the point. Evil flourishes in communities unless they stand against it. Evil flourished in the community of Israel. They rebelled against God's rule and against the shepherds that God had placed over them. In verse 16, we see the Israelites rebelled against Moses and Aaron. God punished the leaders of that rebellion. In, verses 17, in verse 17, we see that uh, Dathan and Abiram were destroyed, notably alongside Korah and 250 other leaders. But this judgment did not spark a radical change in the people. They continued to rebel against the rule of God. And in verse 29, we see the people engaged in pagan worship, including prostitution. But one man did stand against this evil. Phineas killed one of the Israelite leaders who flaunted this evil in front of the whole community. And as verse 31 says, this was credited to him as righteousness for endless ages to come. But the nation's continued rebellion eventually affects uh, Moses and Aaron too. Though they had stood against the evil for so long, eventually it led to them saying and doing rash things that led God to declare that neither would enter the promised land. The evil of our nation affects us. This week there was a report on sexual abuse among surgeons. One woman spoke publicly about an incident 10 years previously that occurred in front of an operating theatre full of staff. She accepted the abuse instead of reporting it in order to save her career. But the problems have only got worse. And the report suggests that there are about a third of the women surgeons are now facing abuse, including rape. It is much harder to turn the clock back than to stop it. So we need to look at this psalm and see where the problem lies. Look at verse 7. They gave no thought to your miracles. They did not remember your many kindnesses, and they rebelled by the sea, the Red Sea. Three things emerge. They gave no thought to the power and the mercy of God in rescuing them from the Egyptians. Then they did not remember the many kindnesses that God showed to them as he brought them out of slavery. And thirdly, because they had failed to recognise God's goodness to them, they rebelled against him. Verses 8 to 11 highlight why the psalmist can have confidence in God. Despite the nation's failure to trust in God, he nevertheless rescues them in a miraculous way by drying up the Red Sea and then destroying their enemy in the waters in exactly the place that they had escaped on dry ground. So verse 10, 12 stands as something of a contrast to much of the rest of this psalm. This great victory gained by God over their enemies did cause the nation to believe and to praise. But in many ways, verse 12 almost seems to re-emphasise what happened next. Two more problems. But they forgot what he had done and they did not wait for his plan to unfold. They forgot. 
They were impatient. At verse 14 highlights yet another problem. They gave in to their craving. Their own carnal desires triumphed in their lives. But the catalogue of disasters do not finish there. Verse 16. They grew envious. They wanted power for themselves. Verse 20. They exchanged their glorious God for the image of a bull which eats grass. They gave up on God and chose to make a God for themselves. Why? Because they forgot the God who saved them. How could they forget the God and the wonders that he had shown them? But they did. And so the list of shames continues. Verses 24 and 25. Then they despised the pleasant land. They did not believe the promise. They grumbled in their tents and did not obey the Lord. They despised what God had promised. They refused to believe that he would be faithful, that God could deliver them as he had promised. So their their state of disbelief, they grumble and complain and disobey. We have already seen how in verses 28 and 29, they angered God by flagrantly choosing the pleasures of sin for a season instead of remaining faithful to God. And in verse 32, we see something, something similar. They angered God. So by the time we come to verses 34 to 39, we see a nation that has totally rejected God and his ways. The cumulative effect of their sin has triumphed over righteousness. They had given no thought to God. They did not remember God's goodness. They rebelled against God. They forgot. They gave into their own cravings. They grew envious of others. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie. They despised God's promise. They disbelieved his promise. They grumbled. They disobeyed. They angered God. Here is a vital lesson for us, for all, uh, uh, for a lesson for all about the slide of sin. Do not forget the blessings that God has poured out on you in the past. You can perhaps remember the old hymn. When upon life's billows you are tempest-tossed, when you are discouraged thinking all is lost, count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. God is God. God's promises are sure because he is God. But the past blessings are a certain witness to give us confidence to trust in God for the future. When we remember what God has done for us, why should we want to abandon him for a lie? Why would we want to rebel against the rule of a God who has poured out such blessings on his people? Why would we distrust and grumble about an all-knowing God who has provided such blessings? Why would we disbelieve or despise God's promise? He is all-powerful. He alone can do what he says. This is the same for us, the Church of God, as it was for the chosen people of Israel. Count your blessings each day, Give thanks to God for his mercy and grace. Take the warning of verses 40 to 42. Their rejection of God led to God allowing the Israelites to suffer the consequences of their own wickedness. God allowed their enemies to triumph over them. Their enemies ruled over them, oppressed them, subjected them to their power. And in verse 43... We see the result is that they wasted away. 
I wonder if the failure of the church in this country, a failure to stand up against evil, a failure to stand up for the truth, I wonder if this failure has resulted in the triumph of evil and the oppression of God's people, a decline in the church of this land. But that's not the end. Look at verses 43 to 46. This lodges the psalm in the post-exilic period. This is the basis of the psalm's earlier confidence in God in verses 1 to 3. Though they were faithless, though the Israelites were faithless, God is faithful. He does not forget his people. He remembers his promises. He hears the cry of his people. He displays his great love. He delivers his people. And not only does he display his mercy to us, he causes even our enemies to show mercy. It was a foreign ruler, Cyrus, who gave orders for the Jews to return and rebuild the temple to honour God. Read through the story of Nehemiah and you will find that when the enemies of God sought to frustrate the work, the, uh, the instruction of Cyrus was brought out again and resulted in the enemies of God's people being instructed to help with the provisions needed for the com- to complete the work. Fourth, a plea for God to restore his people. Verse 47 returns to that plea of mercy that we saw earlier in the chapter. But it is no longer just the psalmist asking to be included in the nation. Now we see him imploring God to restore the whole nation. May all God's people be gathered together in triumphant rejoicing. We do not simply look to God to bless us. We look for God's blessing to come to others. It was not just that the the psalmist wanted to gather back with his countrymen back at the temple in Jerusalem. He wanted his fellow Jews to be there. He didn't want the nation to be languishing in exile. He wanted God to gather his people together. Do we desire the salvation of others, the building up of God's church? The psalmist was asking God to put into the heart of his people a desire to return to their homeland. Cyrus had given them permission to return, but many stayed where they were. We proclaim the gospel, but who turns to Christ? Should we not have a desire in our hearts to see God's church gathered together? If we do, we not only have to speak to men about God, but we must speak to God about men. We must pray that God will gather his people, that our churches will be full of people who turn their backs on the evil of this world around us and seek God. Only when people have put their faith and trust in the salvation offered by the death and the resurrection of Jesus will they desire to praise God for his holiness. Only then will they truly delight in the praise of the, of the glory of the risen, ascended Christ, of the Father in heaven who loves us, and of the indwelling Holy Spirit who is our counsellor and our comforter. Fifth, praise of God. This final verse of the psalm probably falls into two parts. The second half is probably a concluding phrase to the whole of book four of the psalms. But the first part looks like a brief conclusion to the psalm. The psalmist has reviewed his nation's history It is a sad tale uh, uh, of failure mixed with undeserved blessings of a gracious and merciful God. God is to be praised. 
but not just now. He is to be praised eternally, from everlasting to everlasting. Essential to such praise is remembering who God is, what he has done, what he has promised for the future. So we conclude with this instruction. <clears throat> Don't forget. Don't forget that we are sinners just like the nation of Israel was. Don't forget that we, deserve, we don't deserve anything good from God because we are sinners. So don't forget that we only receive his mercy because of his love for us. Don't forget what God has done for you. Keep it in mind day by day. Give thanks to God for all the blessings that he has given you. Don't forget the promises he has given you. He has promised an eternity of joy for all those who trust in him for salvation. So don't forget what he has done because the past speaks of God's faithfulness to deliver his future promises. Don't forget who God is. Despite what is taught in schools today, God is still the creator and sustainer of all things. Don't forget that God is worthy of praise and thanks from everlasting to everlasting. Don't forget your dependence on God to remember these things and for the ability to give him praise. We'll turn to our hymn books for our last hymn. It's a hymn which reminds us of that community of God's people. Number 173, 173. Glorious things of thee are spoken. Zion, city of our God, he whose word cannot be broken, formed thee for his own abode. We, the people of God, are built together into that city that will in inhabit the new world, 173.